Hello and welcome to another edition of Gear Grotto. In this episode, I'll look at the Imperium monitor controller from 2400 Audio. I'm going to talk about its unique interface and why it's a great choice for precision work. I'm also going to talk about the pros and cons of passive and active monitor controllers. The Imperium is digitally controlled and uses a passive analog audio chain. There is no dial to adjust the volume. It's possible to connect an external dial, such as the TC Electronic Level Pilot, but that defies the whole concept of the Imperium. Instead, it uses eight preset output levels. Switching between levels and IOs is instant with no clicks and no ramping of the sound. It's also possible to remote control the Imperium using an iOS or Android device. Initially, I was skeptical of this dial-less approach, but within minutes of working with the unit, it became intuitive. It works perfectly for my mastering workflow, where I stay at the same level for a long time and then jump between a few specific reference levels. Being able to recall these with ease and precision, day in and day out, makes sense, and I don't miss having a dial. My Imperium is the one rack unit model. There's also a two rack unit, upgradable with up to eight outputs and four inputs. The buttons have a muffled and satisfying feel, and the relays make virtually no mechanical sound. The Imperium features three stereo inputs and three stereo outputs. You can order custom button caps for the inputs, outputs, and even level buttons. The parallel output function lets you link output 3 with another output automatically. Due to the electrical impedance change when splitting a signal in a passive design, there can be a tiny level drop when outputting in parallel. The insert function bypasses the level section and loops the signal through a send return I.O. on the back of the unit. This is where you can insert a level dial such as the TC level pilot if you really want to. The insert function can also work in send-only mode by holding down the button. This is useful for sending to a headphone amp, talkback system or a meter such as an analyzer. The level bypass button removes all attenuation on a selected input, allowing you to route directly from an input to an output. Fortunately, it's impossible to activate by mistake as you need to insert a paper clip into the safety hole first. The polarity left channel button inverts polarity on the left channel only, giving you an out-of-phase signal. This isn't especially useful on its own, but if you combine it with the mono button, you can listen to the difference part of the stereo image. This is also referred to as the side signal, and is useful if you want to solo what's going on in the sides. The Imperium plays the difference signal in phase rather than the more common out-of-phase method. Although both methods contain the exact same material as a regular difference signal in a mid-side matrix, it takes a little getting used to. Mono sums the left and right channels for a handy fold-down check, while cut shuts off all main output signals. The Imperium always boots up with cut engaged to protect connected equipment. Before we move on, let's look at the fundamental differences between a passive and an active design. Most gear is based on an active circuit. Active means that the components require an external power source and that they're capable of amplifying the input signal. This includes transistors, op amps and transformers and allow for advanced processing and routing. The price of this flexibility can be noise, distortion and changes to the stereo image. While non-linearity is sometimes desirable in equalizers and compressors, it's not welcome in the monitoring chain. A passive circuit uses components that are incapable of amplification, such as resistors, and don't require an external power source. The Imperium would work entirely without power if it wasn't for the digital controls. Connecting this signal directly to a pair of unattenuated powered speakers would cause hearing damage or blow the speakers. 
In the default setup of the Imperium, each of the eight level buttons refer to a stereo pair of precision-matched resistors that simply attenuate the sound. You can order the Imperium with the default values or your own specified levels. The resistors are controlled by a digital relay, which is why it's possible to use a tablet to control the Imperium. Out of hundreds of online discussions about passive versus active monitor controllers, I couldn't find any claims backed up by actual comparative measurements. So to satisfy my curiosity, I got my hands on three popular active monitor controllers. This first test shows background noise created by the unit itself. For the sake of visibility, I've zoomed in, which means the noise looks worse than it sounds. Here we see suspect number one, probably the most popular controller in the world, used mostly in home studios and small studios. It's a mid-priced desktop unit that retails for about $400. This is also the most noisy of the bunch with hiss, mains hum and related overtones. Suspect number two, also a very popular model, but in the upper mid-tier with a retail price of about $1,000. The noise is lower, but the hum is still there. Suspect number three is a high-end brand that retails just below $2,000. The mains hum has been rectified, but other problems remain. It also features a DA converter, which adds to the noise floor when activated. Finally, the Imperium, which doesn't add any noise since it's passive and fully balanced with no internal conversions. All controllers in this test use balanced IOs and are powered from a conditioner to minimize external AC interference. One of the most common and most annoying problems with monitor controllers is bad stereo tracking, especially at low playback levels. This power balance test shows the stereo tracking as I slowly dial the volume up. The ideal measurement is a thin, straight, horizontal line in the center of the screen. The factory new $400 unit shown here is skewed towards the left channel by 2.5 dB at the lowest audible setting, as shown in the upper half of the screen. Gradually, it aligns to the center as the volume is turned up. The $1000 unit is off by nearly 5 dB, but after a few bumps in the road, it settles on a balanced image. The $2000 unit is off by just 1.5 dB to the right channel, but the dial takes small detours all the way up to maximum volume. Finally, the Imperium with perfect balance. However, perfect balance isn't an intrinsic trait of a passive controller, but is related to the use of precision matched switches rather than a potentiometer. So there are passive controllers with bad stereo tracking and active controllers with great tracking. It all depends on the design. The phase correlation between the left and right channel is another thing we need to check. Any distortion of phase shift can affect our perception of the stereo image. All controllers in this test exhibit satisfactory phase correlation when playing regular steady test tones or white noise. But once you feed them loud, pulsing sub-bass signals and extreme transients, the problems become evident in the active controllers. So far, we've been watching the phase correlation of the $400 unit. The ideal measurement is a thin, straight, vertical line to the right on the screen. The $1000 unit fares slightly better apart from a few glitches. The $2000 unit is even more precise. Finally, the Imperium, with no phase problems regardless of the source signal or the monitoring level. For the final test, let's check out the zoomed-in frequency graphs of the four controllers. For this test, I'm using an averaged white noise test signal. Although it's tricky to see, this $400 controller does show a tiny roll-off at the extremes of the audible range at 20Hz and 20kHz, but otherwise it's flat. The $1000 unit is also very flat. So is the $2000 unit. And the Imperium is completely flat as well. One of the challenges in a passive controller is that the sound card, cables and amplifier connected to the passive unit in theory could affect high frequency response due to electrical impedance. To get the best performance you need a sound card with a low impedance output such as 100 ohms. 
You also need an amplifier with a high impedance input of at least 10,000 ohms. And most importantly, keep your cables short, especially from the controller and to the amp. In my system, I have a 100 ohms output from the DA converter going into a very high impedance 50,000 ohms amp. I have 3 meters of cable between the Imperium and the amp. A lower impedance amp and longer cables could in theory result in a high frequency loss at the edge of the audible range. But how much does this affect real life results? For the first part of this test, I'm using a unit with just half the impedance of my own amp. I've zoomed in on the 10 kHz to 20 kHz area, but there's still no change in the frequency response. Here I'm testing the claim that the frequency response could vary with different output levels. But as we can see, it's flat at all playback levels with the Imperium. Now here's a unit with just a fifth of the impedance at 10,000 ohms, the same as a typical active near-field home studio monitor. I've also added two more meters of cable for a total of five meters. Still, there is no roll-off with the Imperium. This final graph shows that by daisy chaining six 5 meter cables for a total of 30 meters, I was able to achieve a roll off of 0.2 dB at 20 kHz. We can take away at least three lessons from these tests. One, all monitor controllers should use precision matched switches instead of a potentiometer to avoid stereo tracking problems. Two, Impedance and especially cable length influence is a verifiable theory, but with short cables and a well-designed passive unit, roll-off isn't even measurable. 3. An active monitor controller can sometimes deliver more flexible routing of features if that's what you need. So there isn't always a right and a wrong choice between passive and active. Instead, your choice should be based on the sound quality as well as the features you demand. And now, back to the rest of the review. 2400 Audio are continually updating the firmware in the Imperium. Updating is easy and secure with fail-safe boot software. One update added the ability to control the Imperium via phone or tablet. The wireless connection currently needs a computer and a simple MIDI interface, but there's a Wi-Fi expansion card on the way so you can connect directly instead. Another new feature is called Level Profiles. With level profiles, it's possible to combine the existing steps to make new custom levels on the fly. These levels can be saved and recalled for different purposes or to suit different engineers in the same studio. Using the same principle of combining steps, there's also a smooth free range volume fader with 128 steps. The Imperium is ostensibly a simple box with the purest sound I've heard in any monitor controller. And beneath the surface awaits a more flexible and customizable experience if you need it. 2400 Audio have an excellent product on their hands with the Imperium, which truly proves that any audio chain is only as strong as its weakest link.